Um, a lot of what we have been talking about over the last couple of days is kind of how normal people can behave immorally in certain situations and maybe this idea that we have mixed traits. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about is really the extreme variance. So people um, with specific personality disorders that really are exemplifying um, immoral behavior to the extreme and it's really pervasive in their lives. So I want to kind of start out by giving just uh, kind of orienting us all into the general framework of clinical psychology um, and what personality disorders really means. Um, and then I am going to focus uh, mostly on psychopathy. So um, personality disorder, or um, in clinical psychology, we can kind of think of two broad categories of disorders. So um, there are things that people are afflicted with. So you could say a person's afflicted with depression or schizophrenia or substance use. Um, and that's something that we think of as not really central to them. It's something that happens to them and that they want to get rid of and don't really see as a central part of themselves. And in contrast, we have personality disorders, which is reflecting this kind of enduring pattern of traits and behaviors. <coughs> so this some, is something that is kind of central to the person. It's something that um, is diagnosed in adulthood, so it's not something that we're going to be talking about um, in kids when they may be going through all these different transitions. It's something that's kind of become a stable um, pattern of behavior in the person's lives. Um, so this is the specific uh, definition of personality disorders. Um, so saying it's a significant impairment in self, so identity or self-direction, um, and in interpersonal functioning. Um, and one of the unique things is that um, it's talking about something that's relatively stable across time and across situations. So it's not so much like normal people where they may vary from one situation to the next. It's going to be people who are more consistently responding in certain ways that are maladaptive. And of course, this is going to be um, in the absence of other things might, that might be affecting this, like developmental stage or other disorders. Uh, so these are the 10 personality disorders as defined um, in clinical psychology. And I would say that the ones that are more related to character issues are going to be this cluster B. Um, so we have other types of personality disorders, such as dependent personality, um, which causes problems for the individual. But I would say this is kind of less based on um, th more of the morally focused personality traits. So the ones that really have implications for moral behavior are going to be these cluster B, so characterized by dramatic, emotional, or erratic behaviors. Um, with borderline, we're talking about individuals who really have difficulty regulating their emotions. Um, they have um, mood swings. They're really impulsive. They can be aggressive. Um, and then with histrionic, um, talking about people who really want to be the center of attention and may uh, it's more common in females. They may be really um, kind of seductive and provocative. Um, and then narcissistic, I think we know what that would be. Um, so what I'm going to focus on is antisocial personality disorder um, and psychopathy. So these are constructs that are a lot of times confused, and I'll try to <coughs> clarify um, what the two mean. But these are really the ones that I think are most central to this enduring pattern of immoral behavior and essentially what we could refer to as bad character. Um, so this is the explicit definition of antisocial personality disorder. So they have to have three or more of the following things. Um, and in general, it's talking about this disregard for the violation of the rights of others. Um, this definition is fairly broad. Um, and a lot of what it's describing is kind of um, antisocial behaviors per se. So there are some uh, traits in there, such as deceitfulness and impulsivity, but a lot of it's really behaviorally defined. Um, and you can get, this is kind of really a broad category. So most of the individuals that would be in a prison setting would be diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, despite all of the differences that they have. And you can, you know, if you say a person um, has repeated unlawful behavior, they're aggressive, and they're consistently irresponsible, they can be diagnosed with antisocial personality. So that's a really broad category of people. 
Um, and what psychopathy tries to do is kind of um, make this more specific. So psychopathy per se is not in the DSM, um, but it's something that's been considered for the DSM, and there are a number of reasons why um, it's not in there, and they've kind of just stuck with this more broad definition that um, I think one of the main reasons is that it's kind of easier for clinicians to be able to diagnose someone with this versus psychopathy, which gets into things about manipulativeness and maybe a little harder to detect. Um, so like I said, they have to be 18, um, and this is something that wouldn't be um, in the presence of mania or something else that could be causing this kind of behavior. So psychopathy is really referring to a specific set of personality traits and behaviors. So it's not the same as antisocial personality disorder, um, but it does encompass a lot of those same features. So you can kind of think of it as that plus more. Um, and there's a lot of confusion about the term psychopathy. So it literally means mental illness. That's not really helpful you know, for defining anything. <laughs> Um, but this is the term that we use um, a lot of times in the media. You hear the word psycho and things like that. And so people have a lot of different ideas when you say psychopath. You know, they'll give you a variety of different definitions of what we mean. Um, but in psychology, we really have uh, people who study psychopathy have this specific definition for it. Um, so these are the criteria for psychopathy. Um, it involves these kind of interpersonal features, so things like being um, superficially charming, very grandiose, people who manipulate and con others, uh, really people who um, try to take advantage of others and are kind of savvy with doing that. Um, and then what we call an affective component, so they don't experience emotions to the same degree as others do. Um, there is this pronounced lack of empathy that's kind of thought to be the core of psychopathy. And then um, some more <coughs> kind of behavioral um, uh, features, so being impulsivity, uh, or being impulsive, irresponsible, um, what we call leading a parasitic lifestyle. So this would be um, the kind of person who moves often from place to place, convinces other people to give him a place to live, do his work for him, give him money, things like that. Um, blaming others for any bad things that, that may happen to them. And then we see uh, these behaviors. So there's some debate about whether explicitly antisocial behavior should be in the definition, but it's something that very frequently results at least from the other kind of personality features that we see. Um, so if we're thinking about character and all of the different traits and virtues that we've talked about so far, you can kind of think of this grouping as like the opposite of all of those, right? So it's really kind of the worst collection of traits that you could have, I think. Um, and this is, of course, going to be on a continuum, like we see with the other traits. So um, it's not necessarily that at a certain score we're going to call a person a psychopath, although sometimes we do that just for ease of use of the term and to kind of define um, who's kind of at the worst end of the spectrum. But in general, we see it on a continuum, so it's something that we can assess um, in the general population. Um, and I just wanted to make a quick note about a few people have mentioned the dark triad as a construct. Um, I think that that is a bit confusing. So the dark triad is um, psychopathy, Machiavellianism, and narcissism. My view is that Machiavellianism and narcissism are contained within the construct of psychopathy. And so to create a measure where you have all three of those things grouped into one construct seems a little odd. Um, and I've written a paper in Journal of Personality Disorders on this recently, if you're interested in that kind of construct. Um, I think it's just kind of essentially overweighting those two things within psychopathy. But I think it's very good to study those three things. It's just whether you want to group them together and call them one thing is um, kind of a different issue. Okay. Um, what's the difference between a psychopath and a sociopath? So this is another confusing thing. And all I'll say is that no one in psychology uses the term sociopath. So just delete it from your vocabulary. 
any <laughs> ideas you have about what a sociopath is, just forget about it. So all that matters is the definition that I've given you of psychopathy. That's what people study. Um, you're not going to see psychologists <coughs> writing about sociopathy or sociopath. So forget about that. <laughs> okay. And a couple more things to clarify. So some people think psychopaths are insane. Um, so that's not true. They're rational, um, at least a, in some definition of rational. Um, so this is a quote from this book, Without Conscience. So if you're interested in reading more about psychopathy, um, this is a good <coughs> book um, that kind of defines it by one of the leading experts. Um, so he says, their acts result not from a deranged mind, but from a cold, calculating rationality combined with a chilling in inability to treat others as thinking, feeling human beings. Such morally incomprehensible behavior exhibited by a seemingly normal person leaves us feeling bewildered and helpless. So we usually say that they know the difference between right and wrong. They're not delusional in any way. Um, and so you know, one of the questions is kind of why do they behave immorally? Um, a second myth is that they're all violent. Um, <coughs> But the truth is that most people who are psychopathic are going to do things like um, try to take advantage of you, but they're not going to kill you. So of course, some killers have psychopathic traits, um, but that's not in any way part of the definition of psychopathy. So the vast majority don't commit crimes. Um, and I would say um, the research suggests that about 25% of the prison population would be defined as highly psychopathic. Um, people are also kind of interested in this idea that some individuals with psychopathic traits may exist in the business world or in politics or maybe lawyers, that kind of thing. Um, and I think to some degree that is true, that we do see those traits in some individuals. And in some sense, our society can value some of these traits and that we tend to promote people who are a little more bold and kind of willing to take risks and do things like that. So. Um, if you're interested in more about successful psychopathy, um, this is a good book. Um, and then another book that's actually available online as a PDF, if you just Google it, is The Mask of Sanity. So this was actually written in 1941, but it's still kind of the same conceptualization that we use today. And this has a lot of interesting um, case studies of patients who have psychopathic traits. All right, so I'm going to show a video of an individual um, who I think kind of characterizes some of these um, more uh, interpersonal features of psychopathy. Um, it's a bit of a long video, but I think it's worth it to kind of give you a better idea of um, what the syndrome looks like. And um, I know that the previous quote said things about, um, you know, giving these examples of newsworthy criminals, you know, kind of distorts people's view of psychopathy. And I know that I'm contributing to that by doing this. Um, but it's hard to get videos of the people who aren't like on the news. So, <laughs> All right, so this is a person uh, you may have heard of uh, who went by the alias of Clark Rockefeller. Um, and he uh, is a man who is originally from Germany and went by a number of different aliases and um, this is kind of descriptions of people during his trial for kidnapping his daughter, uh, people describing his mannerisms and what he's like. If I can make it work. It's going. Oh, I said it once. When Clark Rockefeller walked into court today to hear his fate, he smirked a bit. During the week-long trial and days of jury deliberations, it has proved an elusive exercise unraveling who this man truly is. For decades, he fooled nearly everyone in his path with tall tales of affluence and power. He said that he was a ship's captain in South America. He was <coughs> appointed to the Federal Reserve Board. He told me he was working at Harvard. He told me that he had quite a lot of money. People were blaming him for the failure of the Asian financial markets. How do you know that? <laughs> Clark Rockefeller? My name is Clark Rockefeller. Clark Rockefeller told a lot of people that. In 
He was a member of the iconic American family, famous for wealth and philanthropy. World Richard Fortson teed off. So when news broke last summer that a Rockefeller may have kidnapped his daughter, Clark Rockefeller allegedly grabbed his daughter Ray during a supervised visit in Boston and then fled in this SUV to New York. It stirred a worldwide frenzy. <coughs> Police now say they believe he may be trying to flee to Bermuda or to surrounding this man. Take a look at this picture, please. He claims to be Clark Rockefeller, but now he's the subject of a manhunt. It was soon revealed Clark Rockefeller was not part of the oil dynasty. He was really just Christian Carl Gerhardt Streiner from Bavaria, Germany. But he used the Rockefeller name to spin a web of lies. He said he was somehow involved in the, in the investment business. He said he was an entrepreneur and was using some deal. During the week-long kidnapping trial, witnesses said he was obsessed with the finer things in life. He made a big effort of borrowing some expensive jewelry from his family. And authorities finally caught up with him in Baltimore. The tip on Rockefeller's whereabouts came from realtor Julie Gochar, one of the first witnesses to take the stand for the prosecution. What is the name by which you know him? Um, Chip Smith. How did you first come in contact with him? Um, through email correspondence. You know, he was always very proper and chipper, but seeing him there, he looked so different, and I used the word deflated, you know, like the, the, the ego and the arrogance that was once there was just gone. He told Gochar he was sailing from Chile to Baltimore and was looking to buy a home. He prepared me for the fact that he wasn't going to be tanned because his trip was spent mostly in the rain. I, what do you mean he prepared you for that? In his communication, couldn't believe that he had been sailing for as long as he had and, and doesn't have a tan to show for it. Rockefeller said he had a seven-year-old daughter named Muffy. The mother was a surrogate and that um, he would uh, be just had destroyed the papers on her identity. Gochar told the jury how she met with Rockefeller daily to show him properties. He was even picky about the name of the street. After an exhaustive search, he chose this secluded carriage house. There's no way he's going to go for it. It's on Floyd Street. You know, when Google went on Floyd Street, and he chuckled and said, that's perfect. You know, and looking back on it now, <laughs> borderline creepy. So. <laughs> <laughs> she was stunned to see her client's photo on the news. At that point, the whole idea of Chip Smith was gone. I had no idea what this man was capable of. She called the authorities. We were out showing the FBI where we knew his home to be where we knew his boat to be, where we thought he may be hanging out. The FBI had the harbor master lie to Rockefeller that his boat was sinking. He rushed to save it, and the con man was con. Following the arrest, he was interviewed by the authorities. It would be the only time the jury would hear from Rockefeller himself. Where are you going? Well, as far as I know, you Okay, can you explain that a little bit to me? Because I know where I was born, you know, I'm sure this detective does, and I'm just a little bit curious about that. I'm not totally clear on that. I could have actually been lost to Okay. Well, it's kind of a difference. I'm just, yeah. you know, I need to work on the point, but it, it just seems kind of like a, a basic thing. Next to the stand, the prosecutors called Daryl Hopkins, a chauffeur who became the unsuspecting getaway driver. I just understood that he was Clark Rockefeller of the Rockefeller family. Hopkins believed he was a worldly trust fund baby. He was always dressed extremely, you know, pants with a little whale all over him. <laughs> 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 the television's most eccentric millionaires. How would you describe his manner of speaking, his accent, if you will? In the genere of uh, Thurston Howells, let's say. <laughs> From Gilligan's Island? From Gilligan's Island. Well, you do have problems. It is rather difficult being rich. If it weren't for the money, I'd rather be poor. <laughs> and in a moment made for a sitcom, Hopkins told the jury what Rockefeller had ordered for lunch. Steak tauntaun. <laughs> the way he spoke, the way he carried himself, the way he dressed, his address, where his daughter was going to school, it all fit. And Rockefeller doesn't have to work. He's Child. Hopkins was paid $3,000 to pick up the father and daughter and ditch the man he was told was a clingy relative. It was actually the social worker supervising the visit. Huh. All right, so I mean, I think that's definitely one of the more colorful examples, um, probably more extreme examples. 
Um, but it kind of exemplifies this idea of a parasitic lifestyle for sure. So the woman that he was married to made $2 million a year and somehow he was able to control a lot of that money and control her. Um, and so it's just really kind of unbelievable that he can have this variety of lies and convince so many people of his identity and things like that. Um, and so keep in mind that that's one type of person that we can consider to be psychopathic. There's also going to be um, the leader of the gang that's psychopathic and just really it can kind of be a variety of different types of people. Okay, so now what I want to get into is really thinking about why psychopaths behave immorally. Um, so we know that this is really a consistent pattern that we see and so there are a number of questions that we can ask. So they do they make normal moral judgments? So is it a, a problem with the kind of initial judgment that they make? Um, is it specific to issues relating to harming others? Um, what kind of motivates their immoral behavior? And what things might they value? So um, Cluckley would say that the typical psychopath characteristically gives normal evaluations, defines excellent moral standards, enthusiastically claims the accepted goals and aims of civilized man as his own. He's often an articulate spokesman for the good life. If the sort of patient described here should have sufficient talent and industry to produce works accepted as valuable literature or art, I do not think it likely he would in them try to express nihilistic or perverse attitudes. Whatever he might express would probably be as spurious, as little representative of authentic human experience as his convincing but empty promises, his eloquent protestations of love he does not feel. His production, however brilliant technically, would be a valid render rendering of neither health nor disease, but a counterfeit. So <coughs> a lot of what you're going to see in a psychopath is this person who portrays themselves as being very moral and having high moral standards, but in their behavior, it's clearly the opposite. Um, so I've done some research with John Haidt um, on his site, uh, yourmorals.org. So this is a site um, that's available to anyone who wants to go on there and fill out questionnaires. And so we have put a psychopathy scale, a self-report psychopathy scale on that site. Um, so I'm going to discuss some of the data that we've collected on that site related to psychopathy and morality. And of course, keep in mind that this is a self-report um, scale. So, you know, items are, you know, worded in ways that are, you know, trying to get at this in a creative way that's not, um, uh, that makes it, you know, more socially desirable to respond. Um, but there's still the limitation that it's a self-report. And then you have to kind of keep in mind the type of person that we're getting. Um, so these are, the sample as a whole is 40% female, 70% white, uh, mean age 32, and 65% have a college degree. So just kind of take it with a grain of salt, although a couple of the results that I'm going to discuss have been replicated in prison samples in relation to psychopathy as well. Um, so the first question is just, uh, is psychopathy associated with differences in moral judgment? Um, so to look at this, we looked at the trolley problem set of dilemmas. So I'm assuming I don't need to go over the trolley problems, um, but just basically the idea that we're kind of saying, um, would you save, um, would you kill one person in order to save the live of lives of five others? Um, kind of looking at the role of emotion in moral judgment. Um, and so there are the two types, some are that are, that are more emotional and some that um, are less emotional. And so we were just looking at how psychopathy correlates with judgments on these different types of hypothetical scenarios. Um, and again, I just want to say, um, regarding moral judgment, I think if you're just asking psychopaths, is it wrong to steal, things that are, you know, there's high consensus in the population about, they're going to respond, yes, it's wrong to steal. So these are kind of a different category of judgments where there's little consensus in the population about most of them. Um, people disagree and saying that, uh, or I guess you could say there's not one right or wrong answer in these cases. Uh, so what we find is that psychopathy is associated with somewhat more utilitarian responding on these types of dilemmas. So they're more likely to endorse harming another person um, for the greater good. So, but these effects are fairly small. Um, we're not seeing uh, really large effect sizes here. 
Um, and again, you can be a perfectly moral person and give a utilitarian response. So it's not necessarily that they're giving the wrong response. <coughs> Um, we kind of looked at this in relation to the different aspects of psychopathy. So factor one is really referring to those more core features of the interpersonal and affective style, and then the lifestyle and antisocial features. And we really find that this seems to be specific to those core features of psychopathy. Um, this was replicated in a prison sample, uh, pretty much, I would say, should say. They found a significant effect uh, difference in utilitarian responding at least in the impersonal scenarios. In the personal scenarios, it wasn't significant, but they had a fairly um, small sample size. So like I said earlier, um, the effect sizes are pretty small. So I assume that if they had had a larger sample size, they probably would have seen this small effect. Um, we also ask, uh, we wanted to kind of look at responses that were more continuous and not just this yes, no kind of responding. Um, and something that may be a little bit more realistic. So we asked them about a hypothetical moral dilemma that was about a military assault on a terrorist target. So we asked them, uh, what is the maximum number of civilian deaths that you would find morally acceptable, assuming that the attack was successful and prevented a future attack that might have killed hundreds of people? So people who were psychopathic um, said that a greater number of deaths would be acceptable. And again, this is a fairly small effect. Um, explicitly asking them about utilitarian principles, um, they uh, showed more agreement with the idea that uh, you can allow the death of a small number of individuals in order to promote the greater good. And then the opposite with deontological, just explicitly asking them, uh, should we never violate certain core principles, such as the principle of not killing others? So we see somewhat less agreement with that. Um, so all of these questions kind of involve uh, causing harm to another person. So another question we had was, um, in terms of morality, is this really specific to the idea of harming others, um, where they're showing these differences, or is it kind of general to all different types of morality? Um, so we used um, John Haidt's Moral Foundations questionnaire. So um, in his theory, he has um, defined five foundations. I think there are six of them now. Um, and they are harm, uh, whether or not someone was harmed, the idea of fairness, so whether or not someone acted unfairly, loyalty, whether or not someone betrayed his or her group, authority, whether or not the people involved were of the same rank, and then purity or sanctity. So whether someone did something disgusting. So kind of the idea of maintaining uh, the body as a temple, that kind of idea. Um, so we first kind of explicitly ask people, uh, when you decide whether something is right or wrong, how much do you um, take these uh, moral foundations into your thinking? And what we found was that people who were higher in psychopathy showed these sharp reductions in harm and fairness. And that was the, really the biggest difference that we saw. Um, so across the other domains, we didn't see much difference. There was a slight negative correlation with the purity foundation, um, but really the strongest relationships were with harm and fairness. So it seems to be more specific to those domains. Um, this finding was also replicated in a prison sample. Um, <coughs> where they found the same kind of sharpest reductions in harm and fairness. The next thing we did was ask them um, about competing interests. So it's kind of like um, some of what was talked about yesterday with the coin flip thing. So if you have a competing interest, um, <coughs> how much are you willing to kind of violate your own moral standards? So we were asking them about money. How much money would it take for you to violate your moral principles in each of these domains? Um, so some of the questions were like, how much money would it take for you to kick a dog in the head hard, cheat in a game of cards played for money, burn your country's flag in private, make a disrespectful hand gesture to your boss or teacher, get a blood transfusion of disease-free compatible blood from a convicted child molester. So you can all think about how much money it would take for you to do each of these things. 
And so what we found was that psychopathy was associated with willingness to uh, do these things for a lesser amount of money in all five of the domains. So regardless of the domain, uh, it doesn't take much money for them to say, yeah, I'll do that. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> the next question is kind of um, what might cause psychopaths to be so willing to disregard these moral principles? Um, and one hypothesis could be that it's something about their moral identity. So we looked at whether they have a reduced sense of moral identity. Um, so we used Carl's scale um, and also a scale called the good self-assessment, which is another measure of moral identity. And we found um, pretty strong relationships with psychopathy here, where uh, people who are more psychopathic in the general population have a much uh, lower sense of moral identity. So they really aren't seeing moral things as central to their sense of self. Um, and then with the other scale, we look at <coughs> how much moral traits are central to their identity versus pragmatic traits. So pragmatic traits are things like being outgoing or athletic, um, being more independent. So things that don't really have implications in the moral domain. Um, and we see that it's really um, the strongest for uh, the moral traits that where we see the deficit. Um, with the pragmatic traits, it was kind of split between the two factors where people who are, um, have these kind of core features are slightly more likely to say that they're independent and logical and things like that. Um, whereas with the more impulsive type um, and irresponsible type, they're less likely to say that they have those traits. And then we also wanted to look at what people with psychopathic traits actually value. So they seem to not value um, things related to morality. Uh, so we looked at the Schwartz value scale. Um, and <coughs> what we found was that um, people with psychopathy, the strongest relationship is with the benevolence. So uh, they really don't value helping other people, doing nice things for other people, anything related to good things for other people they don't care about. Um, and universalism, that's about social justice and promoting um, tolerance and equality for people. Um, and then we see that they do seem to value somewhat more things like hedonism, so pleasure, um, power, and stimulation. Um, I think it's interesting that the there's no correlation with achievement. So they don't want to achieve necessarily, but they want power. So that's kind of, um, I think, telling of what their personality is like. Um, <coughs> so it's really this kind of self-enhancement, self-transcendence um, dimension where they really vary. OK, so that's kind of more uh, descriptive and then the next question is really why are they less likely to value behaving morally? <coughs> um, so there are several kind of hypotheses about the deficits that are involved in psychopathy. One is that they kind of lack the emotions that are necessary to understand other people's emotions. So they don't feel fearful, they don't feel distress, and so it's hard for them to comprehend what someone else is going through. So one psychopath, for example, was asked, what do you think that the victim of your crime was feeling during the time that you were committing the crime? And he said, they're frightened, right? But you see, I don't really understand it. I've been scared myself, and it wasn't unpleasant. So it's like they know the name of the emotion, but they don't really understand what it means to have that emotion. And so without that, how can you expect them to have empathy for other people and be deterred by the thought of harming someone else? Uh, so we see a number of findings that are kind of um, related to this, where they have difficulty recognizing the emotion of fear, both in facial and vo vocal cues. Um, they're less likely to expect that re aggression will result in victim suffering, um, less likely to experience feelings of remorse, um, and report lower levels of sadness in response to others' distress. And several of these are um, in youth, so showing that um, these kinds of characteristics may really be present early on. 
Another hypothesis is that early on, they may be unable to form associations between their own, own antisocial acts and these negative emotions that are kind of required to behave morally. Um, so they <coughs> have deficits that prevent them from kind of learning um, to think about if I do this thing, I may feel guilty later, or I may, or to kind of fear negative consequences. And then another hypothesis is that they might not really be able to attend to peripheral cues in the environment. So uh, if their goal is to uh, get money, they may not be thinking about that's against the law, I may get caught, it may uh, hurt the store owner or something like that. Um, so some people kind of frame it as more of an attentional kind of problem. Um, <coughs> so I'm gonna back us up into the brain now. Um, and I think that we can see how brain deficits may underlie some of these um, <coughs> characteristics or um, at least the first two um, hypotheses that I talked about related to the deficits in psychopathy. Um, and I just wanna clarify that by talking about the brain, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm saying it's biological. So I see brain functioning as the combination of genetic and environmental factors. So we know that the environment can influence brain functioning. Something like a traumatic event early in life could dramatically influence brain functioning. So by talking about the brain, that doesn't mean that it's, you know, 100% biology or something like that. Um, and I'm gonna talk about just a couple of the basic deficits that have been identified. Um, and obviously it's gonna be a much more complex story than this. Um, so we can see from people who have damage, um, they've incurred brain damage in the amygdala, that they demonstrate some of these same traits. So these people are less fearful, they have poor fear conditioning, so trouble with forming the associations, they have less of a sense of danger, deficits recognizing fearful facial expressions, and a reduced aversion uh, to losing money. So people with amygdala damage, they're not gonna completely replicate the disorder of psychopathy, but they have several of the traits that we see in psychopathy, suggesting that the amygdala could be a region that may be deficient in some way in people with psychopathic traits. Um, so we've seen this in structural brain imaging studies that psychopaths have reduced volume in the amygdala, and a number of fMRI studies have shown that in um, a variety of different tasks, people with psychopathic traits have reduced functioning in the amygdala. Um, as well as youth with callous and emotional traits, which are similar to psychopathic traits in adults. Um, I've looked at moral, uh, at brain functioning during the actual process of moral decision making. So again, using those trolley problem dilemmas, um, where people are reading the dilemma while they're in the scanner and making a choice about what is the appropriate action. And what we see is that people who score higher in psychopathy have reduced amygdala functioning during this process of moral judgment. Um, these deficits may exist early in life. Um, so in a 25-year longitudinal study, we found that individuals who are more psychopathic at age 28 show um, less fearfulness at age three. So there may be um, some of these traits that are kind of developing earlier on that may uh, depend on amygdala functioning. Um, in another um, analysis of this, we found that individuals who um, are, have a criminal conviction at age 23 showed poor fear conditioning at age three. So it could be um, that some of these <coughs> deficits are um, a result of kind of early poor amygdala functioning, and that may kind of have a cascade of um, negative effects. And then the other area is the prefrontal cortex that's been implicated. So many of you probably know the story of Phineas Gage, um, who had this tamping iron blown through his prefrontal cortex and essentially developed a different kind of personality. So he kind of became a jerk after this happened to him. Um, and it's what we call acquired sociopathy. Um, again, this kind of uh, deficit in prefrontal cortex doesn't exactly replicate the disorder of psychopathy, but we see that individuals with damage to the prefrontal cortex show a lot of these impairments in decision-making, impulsivity, um, and things like that. 
So the front deficits in the frontal lobe are some of the best replicated findings um, from brain imaging. Um, we see that in psychopaths who have been convicted of a crime, they have a 22.3% reduction in the volume um, of the prefrontal cortex. And meta-analyses have shown that effect sizes for um, reductions in the structure and functioning of the frontal lobe are um, moderate to large across a number of different brain imaging studies using a variety of different types of techniques. And then we can look at the brain regions that have been implicated in um, brain imaging studies of moral judgment and then kind of compare that to the deficits that have been found in antisocial individuals and see that there's just a, a lot of overlap in a number of different regions. We see that individuals with antisocial behavior have reduced functioning or structure in these regions that seem to be important in the process of moral decision making. <coughs> so again, I want to kind of point out that talking about brain functioning is really talking about how both your genetics and your environment um, combine to produce your level of brain functioning. And then it doesn't necessarily mean that you have this brain functioning earlier on, early on and that never changes and that kind of thing. So it's not to rule out anything about the environment. Um, what behavioral genetics studies suggest is that genetics account for about 50% of the variance in antisocial behavior. So of course that still leaves a lot of room for environmental factors. Um, and prospective longitudinal studies have identified a number of, of environmental factors that really increase the risk for psychopathic traits. Um, the ones that are on the right are kind of unique because those factors may have um, direct effects on biology. Um, and, you know, this isn't going to be kind of a comprehensive list. So there are going to be a number of um, experiences and things like that that may um, alter the brain in some way. So, I mean, even if you, if you remember anything that you learned or saw today, your brain is changed by the time that you've left the room. So we have to kind of keep in mind the idea that the brain is really a dynamic thing. So what we know is <coughs> that there are individual differences in the structure and functioning of the brain. And these differences really affect things like how sensitive you are to punishment how good you are at decision making, how much empathy you have for other people, how much control you have over your impulses, or maybe I should say how much you can alter your environment to avoid, <laughs> 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 to avoid temptation. But on average in antisocial individuals, we see that there are differences in the structure and functioning of the brain in areas that seem to be relevant for moral decision making. And so I'm going to make some uh, bold conclusions that, you know, don't take into account any of the gray areas at all, but I'm just going to go for it. Um, psychopaths have bad character. <laughs> A combination of genetic and environmental factors beyond their control lead to altered brain structure and functioning. Brain deficits reduce psychopaths' ability to behave morally. So psychopaths are not responsible for their immoral behavior. So this is something we can discuss. <laughs> 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 um, but I wanted to also um, read a quote. I have um, <coughs> this quote from Neil Levy um, from one of his articles from several years ago about psychopathy, which I think is kind of an interesting um, analogy. So uh, we kind of um, question, you know, whether whether this is something that's um, kind of like a decision that they're making or whether it's something that's really an impairment. Um, and so he compares it to this idea of being a bad artist. So he says, we normally distinguish two ways in which an agent can come to be a lousy artist. First, an agent might be a lousy artist because he lacks talent. Second, an agent may be a lousy artist because he fails to apply himself. The implications of these possibilities for the agent's responsibility are radically different. If I lack talent, then there's nothing I can do to make myself a good artist. <coughs> my artistic production is relatively insensitive to my efforts. But if my artistic production is bad because I failed to cultivate my talent, then it is um, my doing that I am a lousy artist. 
It would be unfair to blame me for my bad art if I lack talent because there is nothing I could reasonably have been expected to do to make myself a good artist. But it may be fair to blame me for my bad art if I failed to apply myself. And he goes on to say, now psychopathy is a developmental disorder caused by amygdala dysfunction, which probably has a genetic basis. There's nothing psychopaths can reasonably be expected to do to prevent developing it. To that extent, psychopaths are more like the talentless artists than the talented but lazy artist. They are not responsible for becoming psychopaths. Hence, although they are clearly bad agents whose badness is expressed in their actions, this fact does not suffice to establish that they are blameworthy. So he's kind of talking about how this applies to their actions as well. Um, he goes on to say, if I lack all artistic talent, then I lack responsibility for failing to produce good art, not just for being a bad artist. Um, so we can talk more about these issues of responsibility, but I want to kind of end by saying um, we kind of are left with this question of, well, even if I buy into that idea, what are we going to do with these people? Um, and so I think that rather than focusing on things like blame and punishment, that we should be focusing on things like the idea that we do need to protect society. So even if you agree that they're not responsible, that doesn't mean that we just set them free and say, whatever, we obviously have to protect society. We have to think about the feelings and the rights of victims of crimes. Um, but I really think that our focus should be more on um, rehabilitation than um, kind of retribution. Um, so I'll end with a shameless plug for my book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <All> right. <laughs>
untreatable, and I think that the literature isn't strong enough to really say that. I think there's not a lot of strong evidence either way, really. Um, so I think that we could possibly get more creative with the types of treatments that we try out. Um, and like you said, by trying different things and trying to figure out what works, that might give us more information about what's really going on with them. Um, <coughs> and then kind of, we talked about the idea of, um, so I'll just, you know, steal your idea of this uh, cognitive prosthesis, um, kind of the idea that we could possibly shape their environment in some way where we can get them to behave the way that we want to despite their deficits. So not necessarily that we have to change how they are, that we have to make them feel these emotions that they've never felt or something like that, but if we can somehow figure out how to get them to operate productively in society um, by you know, offering different types of incentives or things like that, that could be something that is more successful. In kids, I think that there could be opportunity for um, different things like brain training or looking at even, you know, people are resistant to medication, but if we are able to get a better understanding of how medications really affect the brain and we can see that a certain um, medication could improve functioning in certain areas that seem to be deficient, that could be something where the advantage of, of it really outweigh the risks of it. Um, and, you know, things I, we've done some research on omega-3 supplementation. Um, that's something that's probably not going to have dramatic effects, but it's something that could, you know, in some way improve brain functioning and maybe especially early on um, have even more pronounced effects. So I think kind of being open to a variety of different possibilities for treatment um, and really, you know, not just giving up on these people and saying they're untreatable, but continuing to try different, more creative ways of going about it could um, help get us somewhere. Well, I, I should say, I'm going to give preference to people who haven't asked questions before. So if you haven't <laughs> asked a question, you have one. The first one. I have two questions. So one is on the study that you did online. So I'm wondering, if other than just the outcome of the decision making process in moral scenarios, you also had some measure of how do you reach <coughs> that decision? So if you had reaction times and if you asked some kind of justification for the outcome. And then the second question is for benevolence. So mm -hmm. I understand that they're lower in benevolence, but I'm wondering if that's their disposition towards towards others and I'm wondering whether they expect the same thing from somebody else. So I know that they live in their parents' house until mm -hmm. they're like 30 or something, and they also use other people's money. Uh, so I'm wondering if they expect benevolence from other people, or they apply the same standards. Right. Um, so in relation to the first question, we do have reaction time data, and I haven't looked at it. So that would be something that's interesting to look at. Um, but we didn't explicitly ask them for any justification of their judgments. But that's something that would be interesting to do, too. Um, regarding benevolence, I think that they still expect other people to treat them well, do nice things for them. And they have this sense that they're deserving of that. Um, like I said, any of the bad things that happen to them, they tend to blame other people. So they kind of think of themselves as the good person and the right person and think that the world should kind of be giving them things. And um, so I don't think it would be that they think uh, just because they don't care about other people that other people wouldn't care about them. Anyone who hasn't asked a question yet? <laughs> yeah, so I didn't present this, but I have a structural brain imaging study where we found that there's increased volume in the striatum. Um, so that could be something that kind of drives their reward seeking, stimulation seeking type behavior. Um, and that's something that could be potentially targeted with treatment too, where if we at least kind of orient them to a certain type of reward, and focus more on that, 
than punishment, which they seem to be insensitive to, then maybe um, something like that could work better. And I think there are um, fMRI studies too showing increased activity in the striatum. Anybody else who has a question? Hi. So, Andrea, I think yesterday I asked you if psychopaths could forgive. Mm -hmm. Did I ask you that? Yep. Do you remember your answer? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, as in my answer was no. <laughs> okay. Um, I said I think I just said I don't think that that's something that they would usually do. That I think they would kind of uh, be less likely to easily forgive someone. So here's an interesting <laughs> result: if psychopaths could forgive, um, so we only hold people, uh, we, we only forgive people that we hold morally responsible or think that they're morally responsible. And you might think that in order to have um, the cognitive repertoire architecture to hold someone, not just retaliate, um, but to hold someone morally blameworthy or responsible, you have to be able to sort of think of yourself as being blameworthy or responsible as well. And so if psychopaths couldn't or aren't morally responsible and can't think of themselves as you know, being responsive to reasons of the, of the right sort, um, sort of being a part of a moral conversation about their behavior, then that might be evidence that they themselves could not blame or forgive. Um, so I think that they don't think of themselves as being responsible for actions. Um, it's always some external factor that, you know, was to blame for what they did. And yeah, I don't think, if someone does something that harms them, then I guess I, I don't think that they would be, um, I think that they would easily place blame on the other person. Is that, I feel like I'm not really answering your question. <laughs> uh, yeah, just quickly. So the idea is that in order for me to be able to, to be in a position to blame or forgive someone, so you're, it sounds like you're saying they, they, they like to hold other people mm -hmm. sort of responsible in maybe a very bare causal sense. Like, you did this bad thing to me, so I'm going to do this bad thing to you. Just think, I think it just died. Um, uh, in order for me to have the, sort of the, the moral concepts or the repertoire to be able to hold you blameworthy and mm -hmm. perhaps even forgive you, I have to be the sort of person who's sort of already in the conversation, already in the moral community of people who can be responsible and hold each other responsible. This is like a, like a Strassonian point that for people like psychopaths, we take the objective stance to. We, we look at them and treat them as people who are sort of objects of concern, mm -hmm. objects of, uh, that we need to help, right? But they aren't sort of a part of our sort of moral practices. And so, you know, if you were inclined to think that they, that they aren't responsible, that might be evidence that they also can't blame or forgive, and vice versa. If you might think that they aren't, if they aren't able to blame or forgive, then they themselves can't be responsible. <laughs> I'm not sure if I completely follow okay. what you're saying. We'll have to talk <laughs> more later. <laughs> I'll just talk louder. Yeah, <laughs> Uh, I, I, that was that was a fascinating presentation tonight. Okay. I was writing down things furiously. Now I know you have a book. <laughs> uh, that. Thank you very much for that. Um, I understood that you were suggesting that psychopaths don't care about other people. Mm -hmm. And initially, I thought that was going to favor a kind of view that, well, you know, if somebody genuinely doesn't care for something, and their actions express what they care, what what their cares are. That's the kind of thing that we would normally hold them morally responsible for. But you then said, but there's a reason why they don't care. Mm -hmm. It's this kind of developmental, um, there's stuff going on in their brain, their amygdala is small, mm -hmm. they don't have fear conditioning, and genes in the environment get together to make all these changes. I think, I, I completely get that, and that makes sense, but I, I wonder how that argument might generalize and you know, start to take away responsibility for people's positive characteristics, mm -hmm. you know, surely there's brain alterations, yep. there's a developmental pathway, there's genes in the environment that explain that. 
So is there any way to kind of, in a principled way, wall hmm. off why psychopaths in particular are not only responsible, but other people are? No. Have you thought about that? <laughs> There's not. I mean, I think well, that... So you think yeah. <laughs> that's, that's basically what I think. But that's not useful, right? Yeah. Like, we can't do anything with that. So, yeah, I think that everyone is a product of their genes and environment. And so no one is, you know, responsible so for their behavior. So that mm. diminishes their responsibility. It's just generic. Everybody has the same kind of compromised responsibility. That's what I think. But for society, since that's not useful, I think that we have to come up with some way of categorizing, which is going to be arbitrary. You know, there's no way I could I could show you a picture of a person who has a tumor in their brain that's like taking up almost their entire brain and they go to the hospital and report that they have like pain in their leg right they're not a psychopath they have like no amygdala you know like so the there's going to be a lot of issues about um, defining who we want to say is responsible and who's not responsible and it's going to be hard to do with a behavioral measure it's going to be hard to do with any kind of brain measure um, but like we create cutoffs for other things, IQ, you know, we create cutoffs that we agree are kind of reasonable standards. I think that we have to kind of do the same for this. So, you know, right now if you have schizophrenia, you're not going to be held responsible for your crime because we say that cognitively you don't know the difference between right and wrong. Um, with psychopathy, I think it's more of an emotional appreciation for the difference between right and wrong that they're missing and that that should also be considered something that prevents them from being responsible, but it's on a continuum. So we're going to have to come up with some arbitrary cutoff and say these people, their ability to behave morally is significantly impaired. And so we'll say above this level of whatever factor it is, um, we'll say that they're not responsible. So no, I don't think there's like a category somehow. I just think that it's, a, it's an arbitrary line. I enjoyed this a lot, so I'm going to go by the board. <laughs> My question is a smaller board question about your use of the Levinson self report psychopathy scale. So mm -hmm. the data that you presented was based on that scale. Yeah. And, and you would say things like, well, the psychopaths in this data did this, and they did that, and another. Uh, and that, that was just a manner of speaking, wasn't it? Yeah. There wasn't sure. It's, it's a continuum. Right. And the, most of these people are just normal people. So yeah. diagnostic. Um, no, there's not going to be like a cutoff score or anything like that. I mean, what gives me hope is that um, several of the findings are replicated in prison samples where they're using a you know, structured interview, kind of a gold standard measure of psychopathy that's not self-report, and we see essentially the same effects. So, and you know, that measure, the Levinson measure, will correlate with um, these more interview-based measures of psychopathy. So not perfectly, obviously, but it's getting at what we're kind of looking for. <coughs> so actually, that's kind of along the line of your question. I was just uh, a little curious simply because you, know, you mentioned that psychopathy is like, like it's, it's continuous, right? Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. still counts as psychopathic, like, and to what degree you can, like, I can't think of a practical or fair way in which you draw a line of blameworthiness versus not blameworthiness when you have a continuous scale of psychopathy. I know you said it needs to be drawn, it, it's going to have to be drawn kind of arbitrarily uh -huh. somewhere, but I'm just wondering, like, how the individual, like, the, the symptoms psychopathy kind of play into that. So for instance, somebody who's lower on the scale of psychopathy, can they, are they only sort of less like, do they only sort of not care about people as much as No, just, no. Is that kind of how that plays into it? So if, I'm, I'm just interested about how that interplay would work in regards to continuous scale and how you think that might factor into that arbitrary decision between whether or not they're a point. Um, so what the scale is, is just that collection of mostly personality traits. So you can imagine that a person varies on the dimension of impulsivity, they vary on empathy, um, they vary on 
how much they manipulate people. So it's kind of um, looking at all those things in combination. So a person that's midway in the scale means that they have you know, some of these traits, but for the most part, don't you know, fully exhibit all of these traits. So someone at the low end of the scale is just not psychopathic at all. Um, and then people in the middle are going to be like perfectly normal people. And what we're interested in is when all of these personality traits come together at high levels in one individual. And so even though like the way we measure it is not going to come up with some kind of cutoff where there's some big difference between the high scoring and low scoring people because we're just measuring personality traits, we can still say at this level, um, where all the traits are coming together in a single individual, it's becoming really po problematic. And those are the people where we're going to see the biggest brain deficits um, and things like that. And so those are the people that we would want to say are not responsible. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that makes sense. I'm just, I'm, so I'm kind of thinking of it in terms of the art metaphor you used earlier. So you can, you can't really blame somebody who doesn't have any talent as an artist for doing <coughs> bad artwork. However, there is, the idea of awareness and practice, right? So if you tell somebody who, that maybe they're not the worst artist in the class, but they're they're pretty far on the scale of being a bad artist. Mm -hmm. And they're at such a place where maybe if they're, if they're aware, like you make them aware you're a bad artist and here are the things you are doing incorrectly. So there's this idea of awareness and perhaps practice of the sorts of things that they can work on. Mm -hmm. And so to that, like does, do factors like that, in, Mm -hmm. Does that take away their ability, like their lack of blame in those instances, or at least attribute a little bit more blame to them in the, in the case that they do have the opportunity to at least practice behaviors even if they don't necessarily mm -hmm. I mean, I think in some ways, like they're already familiar with what the law is, you know. So I think that they're aware that what they're doing is breaking the law or. Um, you know, they know that they're stealing money from someone or something like that. So I do think there's already kind of an awareness and that could be made more explicit, but I'm not sure that that affects their responsibility. Um, I mean, you could argue with that and say, well, they're very different than people with schizophrenia because they know the difference between right and wrong and they can tell you it's wrong to steal and they know what they're doing, you know? Um, and I guess what I'm arguing is that even if they know and can tell you and can use the right language, they still don't have the underlying things that motivate most of us. And that I think that we as, as normal, I'll generalize, we're all normal non-psychopathic individuals, that we probably don't even realize the constraints that are on our behavior at all times. You know, we've kind of, we don't ever have the thought when you go into a store that you're going to steal something. Like, that's just not part of most of our repertoire of thoughts that we have. You know, it's, so, it's become so normal to us. And so it's hard to even understand, you know, if all of your instinct about not harming other people was just gone, how would you really behave? Thank you. Ron, gets the last question. <laughs> Uh, so I really love your talk, Edward. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you about uh, your, the point you made there, and I'm sure you've got another question about this, about the fact that they're not morally culpable, right? And, you know, I think other people, I think <laughs> Zimbardo once said, I think it was in response directly to Adrian, that, you know, so what we, if they're not morally culpable, right? I mean, part of the reason why you need to punish them is that you need to send the signals to yep. society, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder whether, in part, that sort of argument, right, that you need to, sing, you need to send a signal is sort of, being true to our moral sentiments, that we don't, you know, we, we just don't like the fact that people get away with crimes. Mm -hmm. right? So I'm wondering whether you or Adrian have a response to that type of argument, right? So what if they're not morally responsible? When people in the society yeah. commit crimes, we need to do something to them. Yeah. Right? You you mean like should we be able to act on that desire that we have well, to it's, punish it's someone who? I mean, I mean, I, I, I mean <coughs> some people would say, well, even though we have the desire, you know, 
Yeah. But we do that is a separate issue, right? Yeah. But you could also say, well, as a community, if yeah. people have these sentiments, well, it's not realistic for us to expect uh -huh. communities to not act on this design. Well, I think we already expect that to some degree in that we don't personally seek vengeance, right? We let the justice system right, yeah. handle things. So we inhibit our impulse to react to someone's crime. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is just a further extension of that and saying that we as a society could adopt the idea that we're going to have more empathy for these people that don't have empathy and rather than you know having this um, retributive punishment to focus on we're going to put them in a place where they can't harm people and then focus on rehabilitating them and not worry about you know having to but i mean you have to also think about like how it's going to make the victim of the crime feel and things like that and maybe if there are things that we could do that kind of reduce the distress of the victim in some way, then that could be also incorporated. Also, crime be committed, less of a charge, <coughs> right? So when psychopaths commit particularly heinous crimes, right? Mm -hmm. it's, uh, I think the members of the public are find yeah. hard to accept yep. as well. Yeah, you know. I mean, we find that hard with people with schizophrenia. You know, like, we still want to blame them, right. even though in a lot of cases it's very clear um, that they weren't aware of what they were doing, so. I think it, it's going to be very hard to overcome that kind of desire that we have. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.